Hello and welcome to Dining with Death, True Crime Tuesday. This is an age-old story. It's about a man who says he has been chosen by God. He has special powers other people do not have. He has access to magical objects, to angels who come to only him, and that he and only he speaks with God. He gathers a group around him. He asks for your money in the form of tithes to support his cause. And of course, God always insists that he take multiple women to bed. He rallies support for his group and he allows you to be a part of that group if you follow his rules and pay the fees. This is Cult 101 and we see it over and over and over. Sometimes it looks like a great war between invisible good and evil. Sometimes it looks like a business that's actually an MLM. And sometimes it looks like a guy in a hotel ballroom telling you how to better your life. But at their core, cults are all the same. Some quickly fizzle out, and some last, and last, and last. One of the only differences between cults is just how far its followers will go to keep it alive. This is the story of the man dubbed the Mormon Manson, the story of the LeBaron cult murders. Let's get into it. A little disclaimer here, I cannot hide my distaste for this culture and I won't even try. I have far, far too many very dear friends that have suffered because of this belief system. And when I say suffered, I mean horribly suffered. So my view of all of this is colored by the harm I have seen done to actual human beings, people I love and cherish because of the abuse they suffered simply because they were born into this cult of FLDS polygamy. Now that said, I know there are people who defend it, and I know there are people who love their parents and family members that I am going to be talking about today. So if you are one of those people, you may not want to watch the rest of this episode. People are entitled to believe whatever they want and practice whatever religion they want so long as it does not hurt another human being. In my opinion, the FLDS religion hurts people. And because I feel this way and my presentation of this case will surely be colored by my own personal feelings, I feel it's only fair that I am transparent about how I feel and I give anyone watching the opportunity to stop watching if they feel what I have to say will trigger them or anger them. I'm not trying to make anyone angry, so I'm giving you the choice to avoid those feelings and I hope you feel that's fair. May 10th, 1977. A call comes into the police department in Murray, Utah, which is a suburb of Salt Lake City. There has been a murder. At the time, murder was almost unheard of in northern Utah, and it is still a very rare occurrence compared with other places. Even more unusual, this murder has not taken place in a bar or an alleyway, but at a doctor's office in the middle of the day. Dr. Rulin C. Allred has been murdered in front of a patient right in the middle of an examination. Dr. Allred had been practicing naturopathy in the Murray area for a very long time, and he was well known in that area. When police arrive at his office, witnesses tell them that two young women walked into the office, but that the women were very obviously wearing disguises. They walked right past the receptionist without even acknowledging her, wearing wigs and clothes that looked like they came from a thrift store. The women do not say a word, they do not ask for money, they go room to room until they find Dr. Allred in a patient exam room with a patient. One of the women raises a gun and shoots Dr. Allred to death where he stands. The women then turned, walked out of the office, got into their vehicle and drove away. This was an execution, something you might see in the Mafia. Well, it turns out that's not so far off. Rulin Allred was a polygamist. He was the leader of a sect known as the Apostolic United Brethren. Polygamy is a subject I know a lot about. If you've ever seen the TV show Escaping Polygamy, you know something about it as well. I'm sitting recording this about a 45 minute drive from Colorado City, home to the Fundamentalist Latter-day Saints, the FLDS for short, 
which is an offshoot of mainstream Mormonism. We don't have time here today to get into all of this, but I grew up with these people. When you go to Walmart here in St. George or go to the grocery store, you see polygamists. We call them pligs. That's what they're known as around here. They're walking around in 1800 style clothing, but they have iPhones and they drive $80,000 pickup trucks now. I have a very serious issue with these people because of the way they treat children and women and men. I've noticed that in the last few years, you see them less here in St. George. I think part of that might be because they do finally have their own grocery store out there and it's a really nice one, but a big part of it is because of the publicity. It is not a healthy culture. It is very damaging for children and for women, and like I said, even for the men. So they have kind of withdrawn to a certain degree, but they are still here. Now, I also need to say that the Mormon Church does not recognize the FLDS as part of Mormonism. Both groups use the Book of Mormon as scripture and believe in most of the same principles and doctrines, but the mainstream Mormon Church does not practice polygamy anymore and it does not affiliate itself with the FLDS. So who was this doctor, this man who was murdered, and why are we talking about him? Not only was Rulin Allred a polygamist and the leader of a very large sect of polygamy, he had thousands and thousands of followers. Rulin Allred was actually sent to prison after the governor of Arizona raided the polygamous compound known as Short Creek in 1953 because polygamy is illegal. The governor rounded up all the polygamous leaders and threw them in jail. At the time, Rulin had seven wives and was the father to 48 children. Rulin's group had really grown, and one of his daughters states that Rulin had between 10 and 15,000 followers at the time of his murder. Now, that's a big difference in numbers, but that was her estimate. Before his sect got this big and while he was in prison, he was introduced to some members of another family that were in prison for the same reason. This meeting and the subsequent relationship Rulin had with this other polygamist family would turn out to be the cause of his murder. As police begin to investigate, they realize just exactly what they are facing. Rulin does have thousands of followers. One of them might be angry with him. He has seven wives. One of them might want him dead. Hard to imagine. And he also has rival cult leaders that have made claims he is a false prophet and have threatened to kill him. Members of the Allred family start to come forward and tell investigators that they had been receiving death threats from another polygamist sect and along with those threats, pamphlets about the church that those polygamists belonged to. Rulin Allred himself had found these threats in the form of pamphlets and notes on the windshield of his pickup truck. The notes called him to repentance and threatened that if he did not repent, he would, quote, be destroyed. Now, most religions have a savior, a redeemer, and many have a prophet. In the fundamentalist Mormon religion, this man, this prophet, is called the One Mighty and Strong. Well, now, there arises an obvious problem here. There can only be one, the one mighty and strong. And someone did not like the fact that Rulin Allred claimed to be that man. So now the police have these pamphlets and they're starting to get a feel for what is going on in this subculture of polygamy. We need to go back in time a little bit to get an understanding of how this all came to be. In the 1950s, a group of fundamentalist Mormon polygamists were living and based in northern Mexico, where they were free from prosecution by the U.S. government. But they lived and spent a lot of time in southern Utah as well. In fact, many of the people at the center of this story were born in Leverk in Utah, which is about 20 minutes from where I'm sitting right now. This sect in Mexico became known as Colonia LeBaron, and its leader was a man named Alma LeBaron. Well, Alma dies and leaves leadership of the community in the hands of his son, Joel LeBaron. Joel then formed an incorporated church called Church of the Firstborn of the Fullness of Times and based that church out of Salt Lake City, Utah. Joel's younger brother was his second in command, and that brother was named Ervil LeBaron. For the most part, the family lived on the Baja California Peninsula, but they traveled back and forth to Salt Lake City where they had a lot of business. 
In 1972, Joel and Ervil, the two brothers that had taken over, had a falling out and it was a serious one. Tensions had been rising for a while. These cults took great pride in living in poverty, but they were not in fact poor. The leaders had plenty of control over the money, but they weren't supposed to show it. That's kind of part of the theory of Mormonism. You do not show your wealth, even when you have billions and billions of dollars. Well, Ervil wanted to show it. He bought nice suits and even jewelry. Joel was driving around in a beat up pickup truck. Ervil was not. These fundamental differences in how to live life and how to apply their doctrine in the Book of Mormon to the lives of the people that followed them became more and more noticeable. And then, of course, Ervil started to have visions. <laughs> Here we go. If things aren't going your way in these groups, you could always have a vision to right the ship in your favor. It's That's always an option, guys. Visions are always an option. Don't write them off. <laughs> Ervil has now decided that he is the man. Not only does he claim that he is the true prophet, that obviously means that Joel is a false prophet. Now, of course, there can only be one prophet, I mean, duh. So it was a huge problem when Ervil began making these claims. Joel is painted to be this very humble, God-fearing man who only wanted peace. But did he? Because he sure wasn't going to step down. He wanted to stay in power, let's be clear about that. So tensions rise and rise, and then there is some kind of a major argument. Ervil packs up his family and whoever will follow him, and he leaves. He goes off and starts his own church, and he calls it Church of the Firstborn of the Lamb of God, and he bases that church in San Diego. Ervil has a bit of a built-in following because he already has a large family of 13 wives and at least 25 children. Ervil LeBaron is a fire and brimstone preacher. He manages to poach some of his brother's followers who do come and join him. His confidence grows, and he decides it's time for all of Joel's followers to join him. He sent out word to his brother Joel's followers that they must repent or be destroyed. Well, Joel's followers did not obey. The two groups were very divided at this point, and they became known as the Joelites and the Ervilites. <laughs> I, I so wish I was kidding. Before too long, the Joelites and the Ervilites were at war. So not long after this separation, Ervil decides Joel's got to die, and he orders the murder of his own brother. Ervil told his followers that his brother Joel must be executed for his sins in accordance with the doctrine of blood atonement. Blood atonement is a doctrine in the Book of Mormon that states the atonement of Jesus Christ does not redeem an eternal sin. To atone for what is called an eternal sin, the sinner must be killed in a manner that causes his blood to flow onto the ground in a sacrificial offering. So he does not become what is known as a son of perdition, meaning someone who is forever cast from the presence of God. Now, this obviously isn't something that's practiced in mainstream Mormonism, but it is in the Book of Mormon, and Ervil is using this doctrine to justify the murder of his brother. So in August of 1972, Ervil sends a group of his followers, who used to be Joel's followers, to meet with Joel. In this group of Ervil's followers is a man named Daniel Jordan. The group travels to Ensenada to meet with Joel, but when Joel walks into the house to have this meeting, he finds himself in a vacant, abandoned house. Obviously, he knows something's up and he turns to leave, but he is attacked by the group. They beat him badly, and then Daniel shoots and kills Joel LeBaron. Word of the murder spreads through both communities very quickly, and the Joelites begin living in fear. The murder is actually traced back to Ervil LeBaron, and he is convicted of the murder, but he gets that conviction overturned on a technicality. Some people believe he bribed a juror or a judge. But anyway, regardless of what happened, he was set free. Upon Joel's death, leadership of Joel's church is passed to the youngest LeBaron brother, Verlin. 
kids names I cannot I have never felt more Utah than I do sitting here talking about Ervil and Verlin and Rulin and Alma we just need a Helaman and an Ephraim and a Hiram <laughs> we got a full house so now Ervil decides that Verlin who has taken over for Joel must also die and he spends the next decade trying to kill him Colts gonna cult what can I say so now we have Verlin LeBaron and his sect in Mexico, and Irvel LeBaron and his sect near San Diego, and both groups go about building their religion and having more kids to create automatic followers. Each cult leader is telling their followers, their children and family members, that they must follow them in order to get into heaven, in order to avoid eternal damnation. The problem with that is that both LeBaron brothers were claiming to be the one mighty and strong, and this, of course, caused a major issue. December 26, 1974. Ervil LeBaron rounds up a gang of his followers. He wants his brother Verlin dead. He riles his followers up with a fiery speech, and he tells them the time for blood atonement has come. Men from Ervil's group pile into two pickup trucks and head from San Diego towards Los Molinos, where the majority of Joel's sect was living at the time. The trucks, full of Ervil's disciples, roared into the community, tossing Molotov cocktails into the adobe huts occupied by Joel's followers. The men were armed, and they began shooting wildly into the huts. As people ran for cover, they shot them as they drove by. The invasion took only minutes. But when it was over, two people were dead and more than a dozen were wounded. Verlin LeBaron, however, escaped being killed. Ervil's men drove off into the hills, leaving nothing but a trail of dust and chaos in their wake. Over the next year, at least 10 additional opponents of Ervil LeBaron's new church had either disappeared or had been found dead. He was picking off anybody who said something he didn't like or who opposed his authority. One victim was an Ensenada woman who had sided with Joel over Ervil. Several of the murdered and missing were men who Ervil felt had betrayed him. Many people who refused to bend the knee to the man calling himself the one mighty and strong were vanishing and turning up dead. Ervil LeBaron even had his own daughter, his pregnant daughter, murdered. He killed his wives. He killed former church members. He killed rival leaders. He killed anyone for any reason he wanted. He had his 10th wife, a woman named Vonda White, murder a man named Dean Grover Vest, who had been of one of Ervil's henchmen at one time when Dean tried to leave his little group. It's also said that Vonda murdered Naomi Zarate Shinowith, one of Ervil's father-in-law's wives. I'm getting confused with all these father-father-in-law. It's, it's confusing, I know. But suffice it to say, there was just a lot of murder going on. It's funny how God is okay with killing people as long as you're the only one talking to him, right? I sometimes get into trouble for saying things like that, but I consider Ervil a Baron a serial killer. He took victims methodically for reasons that served no one but him. He killed over and over for power and control over other people. I mean, would you call him a serial killer? Would you call him a mass murderer? I kind of consider him both. But no question, he was a monster of a man. We also need to talk about the cult of psychosis in the LeBaron family. Alma LeBaron, Alma was the original LeBaron father. His daughter Lucinda would have violent psychotic fits of rage to the point that she was living in a hut in Mexico chained up by her ankle. She obviously needed medical attention, but that's what she got instead. Alma's son Ben was in and out of mental hospitals for years after hearing voices telling him, he was the one. See, when some people say that, they get followers and money and power. But when other people say that, it's the loony bin for you. <laughs> Wesley LeBaron, who was another of Alma's sons, would go on radio talk shows in Salt Lake City and claim that Jesus Christ was going to return to Earth in a spaceship. Owen LeBaron, yet another son, said voices told him to be really friendly with the family dog. So we got a lot going on here in the old LeBaron family. But Ervil, you know, call him a serial killer or call him a mass murderer, he was definitely a dangerous killer. And there was a lot of mental instability in the family. I mean, if you looked at any of our family trees and we had thousands of members all born within a 20-year period, 
I'm sure we'd probably be saying the same thing. April 1975. Irva LeBaron has become aware that a polygamous leader of another family, a man named Bob Simons, has been warning people about how dangerous Irva is. Bob Simons was a man who ministered to, preached Mormonism to the Native Americans. I couldn't find a lot of information on this particular murder, but Irva LeBaron does have Bob Simons murdered. At this point, there are about two dozen people dead or missing at the hand of Irva LeBaron, and Irva and his Irvalites are not done yet. Irva has sent some of his followers to Salt Lake City to call members of other polygamist sects to repentance, meaning they have to come and join his group. These Irvalites, I just feel so stupid saying that. <laughs> they are the people who were leaving threats and pamphlets on Rulin Aldred's truck and on the vehicles of his followers before he was murdered. They had in fact gone to Salt Lake City specifically to kind of canvas the area with information, letting people know they'd been put on notice, they needed to come and join the Irvalites. They had been sent out on a mission with an end goal, convert all of Rulin Allred's followers or promise them destruction. They did not get the result they wanted. After months in the Salt Lake City area, speaking with and threatening Rulin Allred's followers, Irvel decided that he had had enough. If they weren't going to join him, then he was going to kill their leader. But he actually had another reason for wanting Rulin Allred dead as well. And we'll get to that in just a second. So on May 10th, 1977, the day we started the story on, Irvel's 13th wife, a woman, a girl really, named Rena Chinoweth, who was only 17 years old, and Irvel's stepdaughter named Ramona Marston, walked into Rulin Allred's medical office and executed him in cold blood. Of course, Irvel had his child bride and a group of women do the dirty work. Let's see, who else used brainwashed young women to commit the dirty deeds they were too cowardly to commit themselves. Who could it be? The problem for authorities, how are they going to directly tie Irva LeBaron to the murder of Rulin Allred? Well, luck was on their side. Two people walking through a neighborhood in Murray, Utah, were looking in a dumpster. They found a bag containing some strange items, some wigs, and even an empty box from a purchased gun. And one of them remembered hearing that there had recently been a murder where the women wore wigs and disguises and shot a man. These people call the police and tell them, hey, we might have found something that's tied to Rulin Allred's murder. Police get to the dumpster where these items are found, and they see that on the gun box there is a serial number. They enter that serial number into a gun database. Two days later, they were able to track the gun to the dealer that sold the gun. The dealer was in Denver, Colorado, and the person who purchased the gun was a woman. Her name? Nancy Shinoweth. Nancy was one of Irvel LeBaron's followers, but she had been at one of her children's school functions at the time of the shooting. She could not have committed the murder. But after intense questioning, Nancy admits that she gave the gun to her sister, Rena Shinoweth, Irvel's youngest wife, who I mentioned earlier. Police go on the hunt for Rena. They cannot find her anywhere. They look in Mexico, they look in the US, but she is proving tough to catch. Rena was a devout follower. She was born into the cult and groomed to become Ervil LeBaron's wife at 16 years old, when Ervil was 42. And it's just disgusting. It disgusts me and I won't pretend it doesn't. Police know that Ervil LeBaron is behind the murder of Rulin Allred, but they've got to find the actual shooters first. They cannot locate the women anywhere, and the investigation stalls, but then they get a break. Irva LeBaron's first wife, a Mexican woman named Delfina, sees a way to finally help herself. Delfina has been kept as basically a slave for many years, and her children are right there with her. Irva LeBaron had an appliance repair business, and Delfina and these little tiny kids were forced to work fixing appliances in order to have a roof over their heads and just to be safe. It's appalling. Delfina gets word to authorities that she is willing to talk, but authorities have to get her and her children to Salt Lake City and to safety. 
They get Delphina to Utah and she starts talking. She tells them about the horrific conditions in Mexico. The family is broke. Ervil has spent all of the money and he doesn't work. The women are forced to go naked. There are rumors of bestiality. The children are not being taken care of and the people lived in fear. One of the children who is now grown said, it was like living in a horror movie. We lived in constant fear. The other thing these polygamist cult leaders in the FLDS are known for is using their children as a workforce. Um, they put them to work very early. They do not pay them. They do not pay taxes on the wages that are not paid. It's a way for them to really skirt the system. And then when these young boys who have been building houses since they were eight or 10 years old in construction companies um, reach age where they can compete with these gross old men for the women, the leaders kick them out of the cult. And these boys end up in my town of St. George. We call them the lost boys. They usually can't read. They can't write. They don't know how to hold a job. Um, they sometimes end up in court because they steal to get by. It's just, there are reasons I have issues with this. Much more than the lost boys, but they're a big part of it. This first wife of Ervil's, Delphina, goes on to tell cops that Rulin wasn't actually the real target. The doctor wasn't the actual target of an assassination. She informs authorities that the real reason Ervil had Rulin killed was to try and draw his own brother, Verlin, who had taken over for Joel, out of hiding. Remember, I said earlier that Ervil had been trying to kill Verlin for years, but he could never find him for some reason. He was good at hiding. He went from kind of camp to camp, village to village, and you know, he kept a low profile. Ervil felt that if Rulin Allred had a funeral, Verlin, his brother, would surely turn up at that funeral and Ervil could kill him there at the funeral. Delphina goes on to tell the police that she directly heard Ervil order the murder of Rulin so that they could draw Verlin out of hiding. This is enough evidence for an arrest warrant for Ervil LeBaron. The problem is they can't find him anywhere. They do, however, finally find Rena Shinoweth and Ramona Marsden, the shooters. Rena Shinoweth was arrested and tried for the murder of Rulin Allred. At her trial, she was eight months pregnant with Ervil LeBaron's baby. After two weeks of testimony at her trial, prosecutors were pretty shocked when the jury acquitted her of murder. The jury said they believed that she was brainwashed. And not only that, none of the witnesses to Rulin Allred's shooting that day in the doctor's office could pick Rena out of a lineup. She was in disguise, but it seems like there was some other evidence. You know, I wasn't there. Um, prosecutors report being really dismayed at this outcome. A 17-year-old brainwashed kid, I don't know. I don't know. That's a tough one. So she was let go. Rena has since become an anti-polygamous activist. She has remarried and she is living somewhere in the United States. She's currently 63 years old. The prosecutor states that he isn't so sure that the jury wasn't afraid of Ervil LeBaron's followers. He feels there might have been some fear that if they were to convict Ervil's wife, Ervil would send his Ervilites after them. In 1992, Rena Shinoweth was found liable for the wrongful death of Rulin Allred in a civil lawsuit and was ordered to pay the Allred family $52 million. Ramona Marston, the second woman involved in the shooting, jumped bail before her trial and fled the country. She has never been found and to this day, no one knows what happened to her. June 1st, 1979. After two years of searching, authorities finally capture Ervil LeBaron in Mexico and extradite him to the United States. He was tried and convicted for the murder of Rulin Allred. Ervil was sentenced to life imprisonment at the Utah State Prison in Draper, Utah. About a year after he was sentenced, Ervil LeBaron died in his prison cell at age 56. Two days after he died, his brother Verlin, who he had so long been trying to murder, was killed in a car accident in Mexico. Now, there are people who believe that this car accident was not really an accident. Now, if this story sounds kind of familiar to you, it's because there was a very recent event that ties into this whole story. 
The war between the Ervilites and the Joelites has continued. You may have heard a horrific story on the news. In 2019, gunmen opened fire on three cars that were carrying wedding guests, members of the LeBaron sect in Mexico. Nine people were killed, with some being burned alive in a car. Three women and six kids were murdered. Now, it depends on who you ask. Many people think a Mexican drug cartel is responsible for these murders, but others, others will tell you that these poor people murdered in 2019 are just more casualties in the great LeBaron cult wars. But we'll have to save that story for another day. Thank you for joining me today on Dining with Death, True Crime Tuesday. Like the video if you liked it and subscribe to the channel if you want to see more from me. Subscribing really does help me out. Stay safe and be kind to each other. And I'll see you next time on Dining with Death. Bye.